to the uh, third Sunday of the series on strangers. This is our Sunday teaching program uh, for adults and um, uh, we have continued this now for five years and uh, the purpose of it is uh, education and this series on the stranger or strangers uh, are on some figures in Islamic history that are not so well known to uh, the majority of Muslims so uh, this one <coughs> we started out with Al-Khidr and <coughs> We uh, went from there to uh, Salman al-Farsi, al and uh, from there now we're going to Nasser Kusro, and next we'll have Hassan Sabah, inshallah, and then the uh, uh, al-Ghaib, Rijal al-Ghaib, inshallah, and that will complete this program. So, as is usual, we we'll begin with the reading of Quran. And then we have uh, say Dusty is with us today, and he will read uh, one of uh, part of one of the poems of Nasser Kusro, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إنا نحن نزلنا عليك القرآن تنزيلا فاصبر لحكم ربك ولا تطع منهم آثما أو كفورا واذكر اسم ربك بكرة وأصيلا ومن الليل فاسجد له وسبحه ليلا طويلا إن هؤلاء يحبون العاجلة ويذرون وراءهم يوما ثقيلا نحن خلقناهم وشددنا أصرهم وإذا شئنا بدلنا أمثالهم تبديلا إن هذه تذكرة فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا وما تشاءون إلا أن يشاء الله إن الله كان عليما حكيما يدخل من يشاء في رحمته والظالمين عد لهم عذابا أليما صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم صدق الله now, inshallah, uh, Sayyid Dusti will read for us, inshallah, from the poem of uh, a line, a few lines from this poem that we'll be talking about. Uh, and I will, when we reach it, I'll let you know those lines. And uh, I'll just let him to go ahead and to read that, inshallah. So 
الله الرحمن الرحیم دانام که به گفتم شمن این دست به برزد صد رحمت هر روز بران دست و بران بر گفتا به دخم داروی با مجت و برهان این کنده نه هم مخری محکم بر لبت بر زافا و زن خست و گواها زرش کرد بر خوردنی و شربت و مرد مرد هنر بر رازی شدم و مهر بکردن گه و دارو هر روز به تدریج همی داد مزوبر هر روز به تدریج همی داد مزوبر چون علت زایل شد بکشاد زبانه مانند مؤثر شده رخصار مزعفر مانند مؤثر شده رخصار مزعفر This basically says when he's talking about his teacher, when Nasir Kusra is talking about his teacher, Amwayed, he says that that sage put his hand upon his heart, a hundred blessings be upon that hand and heart, and said, I offer you the remedy of proof and demonstration, but if you accept, I shall place a seal upon your lips which must never be broken. I gave my consent and he affixed the seal and drop by drop and day by dead day he fed me the healing potion until my ailment disappeared. My tongue became imbued with eloquent speech. My face which had been pale as saffron now grew rosy with joy. I who had been a stone was now a ruby. I had been dust and now I was ambergris and you'll see when I reach it the context of this and uh, I know thank you Said, for coming because I know you had a busy schedule but we thank you for coming and and helping us with that alhamdulillah bismillah rahman rahim alhumma sali wa salam wa baraka ala sayyidina muhammad wa ali wa sahbi wa alayna wa salam Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa alayhi wa sallam wa amabad. On the 5th of March, which was 23 of Sha'ban in the year 437, in the year 1046 of the Christian era, or the common era, a man, his name was Abu Mu'in Nasr, son of Kusro from the town of Kubadian in the district of Mar in northeastern Persia who described himself as being quote a scribe by profession and one of those in charge of the revenue service of the ruler end quote leaves his comfortable and somewhat dissolute life of some 40 years behind when I say somewhat dissolute I must say that people have misunderstood that he had a very easy life but he was Hafiz of Quran he had read both the Injil and the Tanakh he had read most of the Greek books of wisdom he was an expert in mathematics and in astronomy and in uh, many many other subjects and uh, his life was a life from his work for the ruler taking care of accounts that was filled with study. He was uh, one of those people who were drunk on books and drunk on studying. He, that's what he loved to do. But anyway, he left this life and he left that life and all that went with it because he was also very successful, very well thought of, uh, he had a very good reputation, uh, 
everything was perfect, so as to speak. And he went to Mecca to make Hajj. And he did this on the basis of a spiritual dream, or what we call a Rutya, which he relates himself as follows. Quote, One night in a dream, I saw someone speaking to me saying, How long will you continue to drink of this wine which destroys the intellect of mind? This means casual studies and so forth. Because there was no focus to his studies. He just... Some people are enamored with knowledge. They just love knowledge. They love, they love studying. They love reading. They love. It's it's a, a kind of spiritual materialism. It's a kind of spirituality which is an expansion on a horizontal plane, but not on a vertical plane. So he says, "How long will you continue with this? If you were to stay sober, in other words, if you were to focus on something, it would be better for you." In reply, I said to him, the wise have not been able to come up with anything for me other than this to lessen the sorrows of this world. And he said to me, to be without your senses is no repose. You cannot be called wise when you are led to senselessness. It's better to seek out that which increases one in reason and in wisdom. And I replied, where can I find such a thing? He said, seek and you shall find. And at that moment he pointed to the Qibla, the direction of prayer to Mecca, and said no more. Still quoting the poet, when I awoke, I remembered everything. And that's one of the things of a ru yeah, you remember everything. I remembered everything which made a truly great impression upon me. And I said to myself, you have woken from last night's sleep. But when will you waken up from this sleep of 40 years? When will you wake up from this sleep of 40 years? And I reflected that until I changed all of my ways, I would never find true happiness. And this is in his Safar Nama, uh, in the very beginning of the book. It explains how it all happened. This is his travel book, which describes these travels he took. Thus, he made right then the niya uh, to do this. It took him a few uh, weeks, actually, for him for this to happen. And he left everything behind. And he left with his brother and a servant, and they started off on a pilgrimage to Mecca, which he understood when the man pointed to the Qibla that he should go to Mecca and make Hajj. He left on that, and it was going to, but he left on a journey, which he didn't know at the time it wound up taking him seven years, and he did most of the 2,800 miles of that journey on foot. That's like basically walking across uh, the United States in terms of distance. An account of this journey, which he compiled in the latter period of his life when he was in exile, is this well-known work I mentioned, the Safar Nama in which he used notes that he had taken all along the, his journey, seven-year journey. And the prose of this book is like a travelogue, which is different from his poetic works and his philosophical works, because he, he also wrote a tremendous amount on that, that level, and we'll talk about that. And in the beginning, as I said, the very beginning, of it, the first first page is this story. This is the story that he tells about the man coming in the middle of the night while he's sleeping. I started writing this. It just happened to be the 5th of March in the year 2014. Is exactly the same day that he set out on his journey, 968 years earlier. I didn't know that at the time, but as I was doing my research on this, I found out that he started on the 5th of March, and that's when I started writing this uh, bayan, this paper. And I hope that this coincidence, if you want to think of it as such, turns out to be propitious in telling the tale and in making known the life of Nasser Khusro. and I hope to be able to explain why I think it's important for Muslims to know about 
Nasser Kusra. This series on strangers are about people that we think sometimes, like in the case of Al Khidr Salam, you think you know about him, but there's many things you don't know him about him. About Salman al Farsi, people know his name, they know that he came from Persia, they know that he became a Muslim, they know that he saw the Prophet Salam for the first time. They don't know that he was brought up to be a Zoroastrian priest and actually acted as a Zoroastrian priest for a number of years, that then he became a Christian and he studied with four different bishops and until uh, he reached the end of anybody who knew anything and they were the ones who told him to go to Medina because there was a prophet coming, alayhi salatu salam, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salatu salam. And, but people don't know that, they just, they just know the name. And the name of Nasr Khusro is even further unknown. Or if it's known, it's known with approbation. And we'll speak about that as well. So why am I writing about him, aside from you know this thing of, of trying to make these little-known characters a little bit more known to a larger segment of the Muslim community? In the West, he's known mainly to academics, uh, to Persian scholars, and a few people uh, out of the school of Henri Corbin and Sayyid Hussein Nasser and Alama Tabatabai, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, who are drawn to Gnosticism and mysticism. But a very few people, given how many people there are in the Muslim community and in, in the larger academic community. Though he continues to be very well known in Iran where his book is widely taught from high school on. It's, a, it's still readable, still understandable. So, but I'm one of those smattering of people, if you like, in the West who is drawn to mysticism and Gnosticism. Beyond that, I've read widely all of my life and over the last few years in the seventh decade of my life, I have been drawn as a Muslim to try to understand two hadiths of the Prophet وسلم, which read as follows. First one is related by Abdullah bin Umar anhu, who said, whoever dies without being bound by the oath of allegiance, the bayah, dies the death of the time of ignorance. This is the 1,851st uh, hadith in Sahih Muslim. And in another form uh, that's related by Sahih Bukhari and Ahmed bin Hanbal in his Musnad, whoever dies without recognizing the imam of his time dies the death of ignorance, jahiliya. And the Prophet asks, what do you mean by jahiliya? He says, nar, the fire. So, in my own thinking, as far as the first hadith goes, I have always, or at least since I've been about 30 years old when I became a Muslim, felt safe. For I gave my bayah for the first time, mistakenly, before I was 30, and I've given it three or four times since due to the deaths of my different shayuk, may Allah have mercy on all of them, over time. And the original time was when the person who advertised himself as being a sheikh turned out to be something else. Not that he was a bad man, but it wasn't what he said he was. So then I was 28 years old at that point, but that changed. So for some 45 years, I felt relatively safe on the first count. That count which says, whoever dies without uh, being bound by the oath of allegiance, whoever dies without making bayah in their life, dies the, the, the death of ignorance. You have not made, if you've not found somebody to give your bayah to you, to, to, to him, to, to her as the case may be, you're ignorant. And you will die ignorant. And then it's further ramified, and I felt safe, as I say, in this account. But that's further ramified by the understanding of the next hadith in Bukhari and, and um, 
uh, al hambal which is whoever dies without recognizing the imam of his time dies the death of ignorance. So, so far as the first one goes for 45 years, I felt safe about that. I was not really concerned about the other part because I was with my sheikh and, and that changed over the time as they died one after the other and that sufficed me and I only began on the death of my last sheikh, Sayyid Ibrahim Muhammad al-Batawi to really question if I knew the Imam, if, did I know the Imam of my time? And when I really thought about this, I realized that I did not know the Imam of my time. And this led to a very major change in my life. I'm not the same person I was before my Sheikh died, Allah Hamhu, and this became such a pressing question for me. As some of you who are hearing my words or reading this uh, bayan know, I received the Khilafa from my Sheikh, Dr. Ibrahim Muhammad al Batawi, who was a professor for some 25 years at Azhar University and dealt with mainly foreign or Ajnabi students. And he was a Shazali Sheikh who was a student and one of the Khulafa of Sheikh Sidi Salam Aradi. And I also received an ijazah in Muraqaba from Dr. Sayyid Ali Ashraf, the Naqshbandi, may Allah have mercy upon him, as well as an ijazah in Dawa, in calling to Allah from Sheikh Umar Abdullah, Allah have mercy upon him, a Ba'alawi from the Comoro Islands, and further a Khilafa from Sheikh Qutubuddin Yar Faridi, a Nizamiya Chistiya Sheikh. So, as I said, I felt pretty safe. And my main concern was to find and grow one of my students from amongst my many students over the years who would take my place when I died so that our particular line, Badawi Shalia, would continue. One day, in the midst of my reflections, I realized, as I say, that I truly did not know, as I have said, the Imam of my time. And from that moment on, my life drastically exchanged to the extent that all of these ijazes and khulafa and all of these things, they faded to insignificance on a certain level. I began to neglect my students as many of my students know, and why there's so few people actually sitting here. But I neglected my students because I realized I could not really serve them in full. And I urgently began to seek the Imam of my time. In this respect, I must confess to you that I have not been fully successful, though by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have by now managed, I believe, but you can be fooled so easily to catch sight of him on more than one occasion, as well as I believe, though, as I say, you can be fooled, and I've been fooled before. I followed the voice for many years, and everything went swimmingly. Everything went very well, but it uh, nearly uh, destroyed me, because even though it seemed real, or maybe it was real, I don't know, but I wound up in a lot of uh, difficulties. Uh, and it was my sheikh who destroyed that voice for me. Alhamdulillah, is one of his great blessings. But I, I was actually sitting, I would go to Makamat and sit there and listen and hear. They do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. And everything I did worked out very well. But the what it produced in this case Dar al Islam in Abiquiu, New Mexico, is very doubtful as in terms of its ultimate. Well, we don't know; the, the jury is still out. 
but as for me, it was uh, not a not a good experience at all. So I, I tell you that I've been fooled before, so I could be being fooled again. But I believe that I have caught sight of the Imam, alayhi salam, and I heard him speak, and I believe to the degree that it's possible, I have understood some of his words, and. I have endeavored to act upon those words as best I can. All of these, I realize, are preliminary steps. And until I can actually speak with the Imam, salam, consciously give him my bayah, I don't think I will have been successful in my life. And now I'm 75 years old, and I'm not sure that I will have enough time and I only pray to Allah that He, through His infinite grace, subhanahu wa ta'ala, will make it possible and I will be able to both see, hear, speak to, and know the Imam of this time. When I say that this has brought about a massive, at least for me and some who are close to me, change in my life, I will try as succinctly as possible to say what I mean by this and exactly how this is involved with this subject of this bayan an Nasir Kusro, Kudasallahu Siruhu. Now, my primary order, the Shadali Sufi order, is, as is well known, a Sunni order, whose teachings, albeit, originate with Sidna Ali, alayhi salam, as do in truth the vast majority of all Sufi orders with the exception of the Naqshbandi, who take Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, whose teaching is their origin, and to the Ovesi, who take their beginning from Oves, and to a certain degree the Tijaniya, which is somewhat obscure beginnings as an Islam for the poor, you might call it, or others have called it, which reacted against the conservative hierarchical cadre of brotherhood which was then dominant in much of the Muslim world and focused on social reform and grassroots Islamic revival and whose founder, Mawlana Sidi Ahmed Tijani, Qadassallahu Siruhu, announced that the Prophet had directly authorized him in a daylight vision which is called Yaqadatan, uh, vision while awake, to establish his own order which is called the Tariqa Ahmadiyya Muhammadiyya, Ibrahimiyya, Hanafiyya, Tijaniyya. Now, such happenings are not unheard of, but there's been a sheikh in the recent uh, century who claimed that he got a, a jaza uh, in this way. And, but there's always some kind of degree of skepticism surrounding such self-proclamation, in which authority derives from the self of the sheikh rather than from a recognized source such as Sidna Ali uh, salam, or Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. Indeed, Mawlana Sidi Ahmed Tijani who told his students that the Prophet وسلم, told them to take Sufism directly from him, hence the name of the order Tijaniya, and not use any of the chains of authority of teacher to disciple that were the mainstay of all the Sufi orders, saying to him, quote, this is a quote that the Prophet said, to Ahmed Tijani, according to him, you owe no favor to any of the sheikhs of the past, of the path. For I, myself, the Prophet, I am your medium and I am the provider in every truth. Abandon all that you have taken from any other tariqa and hold fast to this tariqa without seclusion or retirement from people, yani khalwa ujla, until you reach the promised maqam and you are, as you are, without hardship, difficulty or strife and abdicate from all of the awliya of Allah, have nothing to do with them. This way of the Tijaniya was widely accepted, especially in, in uh, West Africa, Almost immediately after its birth, and Sheikh Tijani became of such high respect that great masses of people visited him to take his weird and his dhikr and be affiliated with him through the bayat. But still, 
among many Sufi people, they question the Tijaniya on the basis of where is his ultimate authority? Is he the ultimate authority? Well, who is he? This is a question. But I go through that just to explain like how that could be. Now, for myself, as I said, in any case, I am a Shadali Sheikh with a Maliki, because my Sheikh was a Maliki. His family are Malikis. And Shafi, because he taught at Azhar, and Azhar is a mainly Shafi institution nowadays, background. And my own focus was on Sidna Ali, alayhi salam, as the primary promulgator of the comprehensive teachings of the Prophet, by which I mean the spiritual teachings as well as the worldly teachings. It's a very important emphasis on the spiritual teachings of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, as well as upon the eponymous founder of the order, Sheikh Abu Hassan al-Shadli, Sirhu, and my own direct teacher and the source for my own authority, Sheikh Ibrahim Muhammad al-Batawi, Sirhu. All that changed. All that changed. When my Sheikh died a few years back, Allah have mercy on him, when I was in my late 60s and I was confronted at that late part of my life, once again, with the problem of having no living sheikh. Even though I was functioning under his direct orders, and I pray for him every night, and I feel that he speaks to me, and he guides me, and he's, he's still with me. I don't have any doubt about that. But again, you can fool yourself, because <laughs> you're not having an exact talk with the person. As you call him up on the phone, I go to see him in Egypt, he comes to America, that's a different situation. So I don't have that relationship, and I'm very conscious of not having that relationship. And when I considered the ramifications of that situation, I was hit head-on with the full consequences of the meaning, whoever dies without recognizing the imam of his time dies the death of ignorance. Because I had all of the bayat, I had done all of that, I certainly didn't know who that was. Because the Shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon him, and Qadess Allah who had never specifically told me who was the Imam, alayhi salam, where he was, how I could find him, or what was I supposed to do, especially now I can no longer directly ask him about this matter of my great concern. Because maybe 10 years earlier I might have asked him that question, and he might have answered it very simply in a way that would put my heart at rest. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. Around the same time that this happened with his death and so forth, and this reading this poem, I was intimately engaged in working with a group called the North American Islamic Foundation, known as Knife. And I gave khutbahs in their masajid, and I helped organize events with them, such as the annual maulid, because I'm very uh, attached to the maulid, and dedicated to the maulid, and also for Yom al-Ashura and Karbala and, and so forth. In the course of helping in organizing these events, I was usually asked to give, along with other speakers, a bayan at such event, like I'm doing today. One year, I was asked by the organizers to speak on the post Karbala message of Sayyidina, Sayyidina Zainab salam, in the context of Ali Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Well, central to this bayan was a discussion of the talk that she gave salam, in Damascus condemning Yazid, specifically focusing on his treatment of Imam al Hussein and the household of the Prophet al-Bayt al-Quran. Unfortunately, even though what I said was truthful, I quoted her exact words, I read her exact words, it certainly did not go over well with some of the members of this uh, North American Islamic uh, Federation or Foundation, and as well as with some of the people who were in attendance from Ali Sunnah wa Jamaat, who felt that I was respectful, that I should have said radiallahu ta'ala anhu after mentioning uh, Yazid or uh, his father Muawiyah. 
but I did not feel inclined to do that at all, on the contrary, then and now. The upshot of that was they dropped me unceremoniously from all their functions and never told me <coughs> even directly why they had done it, but I have gathered through friends who have spoken with me that it was due to my rather trenchant views on Muawiyah and Yazid, who they regarded, at least to some degree, or some of them, as being loyal ashab, loyal companions of the Prophet My own response to this was hurt and anger, as I put a lot of effort over a five-year period in helping build up a community outreach program for Naif. But as many things turn out, it was, alhamdulillah, a blessing. A blessing that marked, as it were, another thing, an end to what had been a long period of my life and the beginning of another. What do I mean by this? Many years ago, when I was a relatively new, naive, and yes, even fairly ignorant Muslim studying in Egypt after three years of intense Arabic and Sharia studies in Mecca, I first came across in a meaningful way, rather than a casual one, a meaningful way, with the hadith of the event of the cloak, also known as the hadith of Mubahala. This hadith of the cloak, al hadith al kisa refers to an account of an incident when the Prophet ﷺ gathered Hassan, Hussein, Ali, and Fatima underneath his cloak. And it is mentioned in several hadith, including Sahih Muslim, I think there's over 40 hadith about it, where the Prophet ﷺ is quoted, but in this particular one in Sahih Muslim, this is a, a, one that is attributed to Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, who said that the Prophet ﷺ went out one morning wearing a striped cloak of black camel's hair, and there came along Hassan bin Ali, salam, and he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wrapped him under it, and then came Hussein, alayhi salam, and he wrapped him under it, along with his brother. And then came Fatima, alayhi salam, and he took her under it, and then came Ali, alayhi salam, and he took him under it, and said, Allah only desires to take away any uncleanliness from you, O people of the household, and purify you thoroughly, which is an ayat from Quran 3333, 33, and you'll find this hadith in Sahih Muslim. Anyway, we've all read that hadith, we said there's suddenly, you know, I said, whoa, you know, like what is this? You know, what what is really going on here with this? And I somehow when I was really ready and able to read this hadith with its true meaning, I remember being struck like somebody hit me almost over the head or, or like water went over me with a great love of the al -Bayt. And immediately I also recall that all of my teachers in authentic Sufism, aside from the first man who was not really authentic in teaching Sufism, who was teaching a kind of New Age type of teaching, had been members of that family. All of my teachers have been from the al -Bayt. And that somehow, because of this, I must be connected with the Ahl Bayt, myself, at the deepest level, which is the level of the Bayah. Because all these people whom I had Bayah with were from that family. And this had been percolating for years through all of my studies and my writing and my work, but now the time of the percolation, so as to speak, was over. And a new era had begun, though I could only feel it in the somehow in Kuwait way, I couldn't really put it together. There was pieces here and pieces there, and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I was a bit misty and not quite clear. What was clear was, in spite of all of that, that this was my way, and immediately I felt a great sense of freedom and love at the same time. Now, I hope I'm not taxing any of you with these details about myself when I'm meant to be talking about Nasser al Kusro you'll, I think, understand what I'm talking about as I go deeper into this. So if you go a few years forward, I found myself, one, the loss of the sheikh, knowing I do not know who is the imam, my connection and love with the attachment to al -Bayt. and I find myself in the midst of my readings, because I read widely, and my studies, coming across a poem 
by somebody who's reputed to be, and I, I read many, many, many books, and so I try to read very widely and understand, a great Persian mystic, that's all I know about him, who is a poet, a traveler, and a philosopher, whose name is Nasser al-Kusru, Kedasallahu uh, Siruhu. Uh, and in his poem, this poem that I happen to be reading, which which Sayyid Dusti read from, the Confessional Ode, or the Qasida Etrafi, he is saying, and this is the translation that I've made with the help of some of my Persian friends, and it's bound in the printed copy of the talk. Uh, unfortunately, uh, those who are listening won't have the benefit of that, but go to the website and you can get a copy of it. It's very inexpensive. He says, he says, this is a quote from a poem. And this is a man who's, you know, as I say, you know, he's a, um, uh, he knows all of the Quran by heart. He's read the, the Old Testament, the New Testament. He's read all the Greek scholars. He's, he's a really widely read man, widely, really attuned to wisdom. And he says, from every school that I searched, whether it was the Shafi or the Maliki or the Hanafi or the Hanbali, I sought a sign of guidance of the Chosen One of Allah, the Almighty, the Guide. And each one that I read pointed me in a different way, one to China, one to Africa. Here he's being, <coughs> you know, saying, I went this way and that way. When I asked for a reason <coughs> or from corroboration from the Quran itself, these people, these teachers, these ulama, <coughs> recoiled in helplessness, like blind men, like deaf men. And then one day I was reading uh, in the book, meaning the Quran, the ayat concerning the oath. In which Allah proclaims that his hand is above all hands. And I pondered about that group who had sworn allegiance to him in the beginning beneath the tree, like Jaffer and Mikdad and Salman and Bara. And I asked myself, where is that tree and where is that hand? When shall I see that hand? When shall I see those people? When can I make that oath? This is all in his poem. I asked, but I was rebuffed. I was told they are no more. The tree, the hand are gone. The assembly is dispersed. The hand is concealed and veiled in secrecy. Those men that you mentioned were the companions, favored by that allegiance and chosen to be with the Prophet ﷺ in the Jannah, in the garden. I felt so sad when I read this. I remember reading over and over again, they are no more, <clears throat> so I was told. The tree, the hand, they're all gone. The assembly is dispersed. The hand is concealed and veiled in secrecy. Of course, I knew that what he was writing was only partially true, for I had found both the hand and the tree in my life, but even after having found them, still everything was gone. My life was reaching an end, and as yet I did not know the imam of my time. And to understand what this means, you have to understand the meaning of authority. Yes, there are many thousands of shayuk all over the world. Some of them are ulama as well, and fuqaha, awliya, arafin. But ask yourself, who of these people really know the imam of our time? A friend of mine and a student recently told me he was going to attend a conference at which many of the eminent shayuk of the time were to be present, including some of those that I usually call the rock and roll shayuk, by whom I mean those who fly first class, sleep in five-star hotels, even if one of them wears a shiny suit with a scruffy kufi, charge $5,000 for the blessing of their exalted presence, always manage to have two or three security men around them, and they can even get you into the mustard of the prophet when the Alayhi when the doors are closed after Salat Alisha. These are the rock and roll shayuk. So I asked my friend politely, 
to go around and to speak to these guys, these eminent Illuminati, and ask them, did they know who is the Imam of the age? And if they don't know, then they, he should know that they are as ignorant as he is, and I am. Despite having flown first class, and despite sleeping in the five stars, they have no real authority. None of these people, unless you know who is the Imam, you have no authority. No authority. No real authority. You have authority, but no real authority. Real authority remains with the person being asked a question politely and directly and with no witnesses about saying, yes, I know, and pointing with direct knowledge at who the Imam is. I met one man once, a very, very saintly man who had been through a lot of things, whose name I won't mention right now. And I asked him, because we were talking about the subject, did you ever see Al-Mahdi, alayhi salam? And his face turned red. He's brown, brownish. His face turned red. And bubbles of sweat popped out of his forehead. It, it was, he looked exactly like you describe, like you find described in the Hadith when the Prophet ﷺ used to get the wahi. He began to tremble and to shake. And and he couldn't get the words out of his mouth until finally he told me, yes. And this is the only person in all the people that I've met in 40 some odd years in, in being involved in this who said yes, and I believe him, that he had seen Al-Mahdi, alayhi salam. Not in a dream, not in a vision, but he had actually seen him. And that's only one person. And again, it was just like I said, it was private, it was in quiet, there was nobody else around, there was nobody else, he wasn't showing off for anybody or anything like that. This was what they call man to man, you know, a question, an answer. Did you? Yes, I did. Beyond that, I didn't go into it with him. I thought that he would have apoplexy, as a matter of fact. I mean, he was so, he was shaking all over, his face was sweating like that, he was bright red. I mean, he was obviously you know, very, very, very deeply affected by that. And this is a man who was a general in the army prior to his being a great Sufi and uh, fought in battles uh, against the uh, Zionists in the front line. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a very truthful, honest and sincere man. And this is what he told me. But as to the point above, these people who don't know, don't know, and they have no authority. They have no real authority. They have limited authority, let's say, but they have no real authority. Because real authority remains only with the person who, having been asked the question politely and directly, with no witnesses around, nobody to show off for, really knows by direct knowledge who is the Imam of this time. Real authority has nothing to do with blood, it has nothing to do with lineage, or tribe, <coughs> or madhab, or tariqa, any of that stuff, nothing. It has to do with knowing or not knowing, period. And this, at least, I imagine what or who Nasser Kusro, Kadesallahu Siruhu, was in search of when he took the road exactly 960 years ago today, the day that I was writing this. His journey was certainly not first class and not five star. He says, quote, many a night I made a stone from my pillow and the clouds were my tent and I sank as low as a fish and I ascended sometimes as high as the stars above the hills. Now in the land where water was frozen like marble now in the land where the very dust was hot as sparks, and I roamed, now on the sea, now on the plateau, trackless wastes, across mountains, sand, streams, up and down precipices, a coil of rope around my shoulder like a camel driver, <clears throat> a pack on my back like a mule, 
inquiring everywhere I went, searching from city to city and sort of sort. And this is what I'm trying to tell everybody. This is what you have to do if you want to know the truth. This is this is what you have to do. You cannot go sitting in your house and reading books and doing this and watching things on YouTube and so on and so forth. This is not you may find out this, that, and the other thing, but this is not what's going to do it. You've got to go and find just like our earlier ancestors, the Salaf, went and they would go thousand miles on foot to find the hadith. Now we have all the hadith. Now what we need now in this time where is this man who knows? Where is this man of knowledge? And there are, reputedly, there are 313 of them who actually know. So we know that they know. And we know that they're here. We even have a number. In other cases I've seen, so they mentioned 4,000. But in the other case, they mentioned 313, which is the same number as the people who were at the Battle of Badr. But anyway, there are people here who know. There are people in this world who know who is the Imam of the time. They not only know, they speak to them, they speak to him, they have bayat with him. They're here. But you've got to find them. And you're not going to find them sitting in your house on your duff. you got to go out, like as he says, uh, many a night I made a stone from my pillow and the clouds from my tent. Hmm? And the story of this journey that he took is recorded in the Safar Nama, or travelogue and again these are notes that he took and he only wrote them all down uh, after he had finished the end of his life and uh, he wrote about this journey that he took it's not my intention to speak a long time about the Safar Nama I mean this is a travelogue there are many books a number of books at least on the subject and indeed, you can in, uh, download it, uh, albeit in Urdu, but some parts of it also in Scribe D and from the net. In it, briefly, he recalls dozens visits to dozens of cities over a seven-year period, from March 6, 1046, to October 23rd of 1052. You see, it's very well known exactly when this all happened. And he writes comprehensively about the cities, including the holy cities of Islam, which he includes details about schools, caravans to Rai, fortifications, he always wrote about fortifications, masajid, water supplies, he was very keen about writing about water supplies, scientists in those cities, the kings of the areas that he visited, the public, the population, the area of the cities, and of course his own interesting memories about what happened when he went there. And as I said before, amazingly, after a thousand years, this book is still popular, readable for Persian speakers, and taught in schools all over modern Iran. He also wrote a book on mathematics, which has disappeared, as well as the Zad al-Musafirin, or the traveling provisions of pilgrims, and Wajidin, or the face of religion, which are theoretical descriptions of religious and philosophical principles, and Gushayish Arashayish, which is a philosophical work that is translated into English by F.M. Hunzai under the title Knowledge and Liberation. You can read it and see what he thinks, which discusses creation, questions related to the soul, epistemology, and the doctrines of the Fatimiyun, which he became. He left as a Sunni, by the way. When he left on his trip, he was a Sunni. And after he studied with Muayyad, he became a Fatimi. He, it wasn't his original uh, what he came from. Also, there's available uh, reconciliation of the two wisdoms, uh, Jami al Hikmatain, as well on a somewhat lower key, his Book of Enlightenment, uh, which is known as Shish al Fasl, and the Book of Felicity, and many different smaller books. Some there's questions about, but the, there's m many things you can find that he talks about the philosophical brotherhood of the Basra, the Ikhwan al Safa, for instance, and many Shia and pre Alamuti Ismaili ideas, which were new to him, because that's not where he was coming from. He was coming from a Sunni background. He, in the second or the ethical section of his poem, he, uh, he talks about moral maxims, uh, thoughts on man's good and bad qualities 
on the necessity of shunning the company of fools and double-faced friends, the deceptive allurements of the world, and the secret snares of ambitious men who crave rank and wealth. He writes about everything, really, in the world. It's a, a big book. And it uh, concludes with an imaginary vision of a beautiful work of spirits who have stripped off the fetters of earthly cares and sorrows and revel in the pure light of divine wisdom and love, which, of course, is, which I'll speak about later, the object of the Fatimid thought. But in general, I won't be referring, except in passing, to any of these works, but pay more attention to another work of his, which is the Diwan, which is composed in his latter days and contains most of his lyrical poetry. And the chief topics of these are the enthusiastic praise of Ali alayhi salam and the descendants, alayhi salam, uh, of Ali alayhi salam, and in particular the eighth Fatimi Imam Mustansir, Billah uh, alayhi salam, who he actually met in Cairo. And mind you, the, the, the Ismailis are not like the Ethnosri. Ethnosri, the whole thing comes to a relative end with the twelfth Imam who's in seclusion. So they don't have an imam. They don't have anybody to go. They're, they're in the same place, actually, as the Sunnis are, except later on, in a certain way. But these people have an imam. In other words, the people who followed from Jaffer, Sadiq, and Ismail, and Muhammad, uh, have still a living imam. Or not Maybe still, after the post-Alamuti, period not so clear, but in that time, in the time of the Fatimids, they definitely had an imam who they could talk to, and I'll go into some of that in this talk as well. And their ideal was to restore people to their original nature. As I said before, insan fi asani takim. Allah says, I created the human in the best of forms. Then he descended into the worst of forms. But he was once in the best of forms. So the object of all of the work of the Fatimiyun was to restore people to their original form. This is when we say the 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 uh, the the uh, in the moment the Eid al Fitra. We're talking about fitra, you know, the, 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 the real being as the human being is created. Everybody created in the form of the fitra. That was their object, to return people to their original nature, whatever they were. They didn't care what you were. They didn't care who you were, anything about that. What they re we were interested in is how can we return you to who you were when you were born? Hmm? And this man, that, that Imam uh, Mustansir Billah, he was the Imam for 60 years. And he had, so he had a long time to work on this uh, project. Indeed, he, that is the longest of all the Khulafa in the Muslim world, either in Egypt or elsewhere in any of the other Islamic states. And his bab, or his gate, as Ali was the bab of Muhammad, was Muayyad Fidina Shirazi who was the teacher of Nasir al-Kusro, and this man was called the Da'iyat Mutlaq, or the unrestricted caller, or a Bab al-Abwab, the gate of gates, or Da'iyat Duwat, the chief caller, etc. That's who he was. That's the teacher. That's the man who brought him to the Fatimi way of thinking, was this man, Muayyad Fidina Shirazi, Qadassallahu Sirahu. In his theological and in his philosophical writings, he brought the spiritual heritage of the Fatimid to its pinnacle. And in this position, he worked inside the house of knowledge, Dar al Ilm or Dar al Hikmah, teaching the dua, the missionaries, the da'is, from both inside and outside the Fatimid lands. And we'll talk more about that because there were 12 of these lands, composing the theological works until the end of his life in 1078. And this Diwan, which is a compilation in poetic form of many of these ideas, contains 
passionate outcries against the duplicities and deceptions of Khorasan, which is his homeland and its rulers, who wound up when he came back to his home, driving him from his home, and, and sometimes his deep despondency in seeing himself despised by his former associates, excluded, ostracized, anathematized as a dog, as an exile, and forbidden from all participation in the interplay of scholars and teachers in the Sunni world that existed in the state of Khorasan. They didn't want to hear from him. No, they didn't want to hear from him. They wanted to get rid of him. They, and they did get rid of him. They drove him and drove him and drove him until they drove him out into this, like they did with the Prophet Salaam, into this little, little valley called Badakhshan, a very, very remote part of the world. Because they didn't want to hear it, what he had to say. Scattered through all of these outbursts of hope and despair, there are lessons of morality, warnings against the tricks and the perfidies of the world, against the vanity of earthly spenders, splendors and greatness, against the folly and injustice of men, against hypocrisy, frivolity, viciousness, the viciousness especially of fashionable society, and that of government courts in particular. The Diwan includes many lyrical and beautiful passages as well, which explores his love of the quiet solitude of his final place of exile and his place of burial in Yungan, in Badakhshan, where he taught under the protection of the ruler of that province in the very last years of his life and brought many people to an understanding of the teachings of the Fatimids and conveyed to, as were conveyed to him by his teacher, Muayyad Fadin Ashirazi. I first came into contact with this Diwan in an edition of the Imperial Iranian Academy of Philosophy, translated by Ghulam Reza uh, 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 Avani and Peter Lamborn Wilson, who you may know as Hakim Bey, when the latter was a student of Sayyid Hussein Nasser's in the late 60s and early 70s of the last century. And this marked the first time I read, and it was in a truncated and <coughs> highly edited version of the Qasida Itrafi, uh, of, uh, of Nasser al Kusro. At the time I, when I read it, I must confess that it went in one eye and out the other. But one phrase really deeply registered, I remember it till today, when he was speaking about a sheikh, he wrote, I stood before you, quote, I stood before you, pale and skeletal, clad in a woolen cloak, and I kissed your hand. I kissed your hand as if it were the grave of the Prophet وسلم, or the black stone of the Kaaba. And mind you, at this time I was studying at the Markaz al logat al-Arabiya in Mecca, which is perforce a very Saudi institution, and for some reason the library had ordered a copy of this book, and myself starved for anything remotely Sufic, I borrowed the book from the library, and I admit I was shocked by what this guy Nasser Kusro had written, kissing the hand of the sheikh as though it were the grave of the prophet or the black stone of the Kaaba. I was living in Mecca and I saw every day people kissing the black stone. And I couldn't imagine that anybody would kiss somebody else's hand as though it were that. In any case, this was my first introduction to his diwan. And among the things I remember that stuck with me from this was an introduction by Peter Lamborn Wilson when he wrote, quote, Most probably all of the Diwan was written after Nasser Khusro's wanderings had ceased, after his search for wisdom among all the sects had, culminating, had culminated in his meeting in Cairo with the Fatimi Iman, and after his mission to Khorasan had ended in exile in Yamgan. It's the poetry of an old man, only in his best moods, reconciled to the life of an exile or hermit. A man <clears throat> who has precisely failed, at least outwardly, to mold the world closer to his heart's desire. When he cautions the Fatimid missionaries, the Dua, warning them <clears throat> that the society at large will reward their preaching only with violence, 
he obviously speaks from direct experience. The golden court of the Fatimid Khalif at that point in Yamgan was like a dream in his bleak valley, not to be found anymore in the world which actively persecuted him and rejected his teachings and his ultimate mission. Now, myself, I'm in my mid-70s. I realize the portents of that passage and why it stuck with me even then, having faced, been faced in my own life for my words by a man, takfiri man with a rifle who entered my house intent on killing me and my family. Actually happened. I bless my dear friend and dead friend Yusuf, may Allah be kind and merciful to him for turning the man back and shining him on and, and getting him out of the house. And I came within inches of being stabbed in the back, actually in the act of leading prayers in the prison where I served as a chaplain. And I have been asked, don't return to so many masajid I can't even begin to tell you because of what I say in my khutbahs. does not fit in with the views of the mainly misogynist, literal, legal custodians of the ex post facto prophecy of the fourth Hijri century. That's my experience. In any case, to follow along with our fourth century Hijri traveler who was to become as a result of the infinite grace of Allah in his studies with Muayyad and the Imam, a living, loving, life-giving proponent of direct insight into prophecy, he and his brother left from Bakh for Nishapur on the 5th of March, as I've noted, in the year 1046 of the Common Era, corresponding to the 23rd day of Shaban in the year 4437 of the Hijri calendar. Two and a half months, that was, I was wrong, it was not weeks. Two and a half months after his visionary dream of the, and he, at that time he got rid of everything, right? Two and a half months after that dream about the man who upbraided him for wasting his life and pointed out to him the Qibla, asking how long he's going to concern himself with these earthly blessings for his body instead of looking for the blessings of knowledge for his soul. And he arrived in Nishapur at the time of a lunar eclipse six weeks later on Shawal 11th or the 21st of April. Can I stop here for a few minutes? Take a break if anybody wants to drink a little coffee or tea. Welcome for you. And yes. then I'll continue. Inshallah. No, I don't. But anybody want to take a, you know, too much talking. <laughs>
Audhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim uh this is the second part of this talk on uh, Nasir al-Kusro kadas Allah wa uh on the 31st of uh, 30th of uh, March uh at the uh, Islamic Study Center so I had arrived uh or he excuse me he had arrived finally at Nishapur uh, this is the beginning of his uh, quest at the time of a lunar eclipse six weeks after having left his home uh, on Shawal the 11th is when he arrived. And he said that his spiritual quest, quote, at this point was to find the most perfect being in the world. That's what he was trying to find, the most perfect being in the world. And with that in mind, he set off from Mecca and he traveled there by way of uh, Shah Abdul Khan to Mer, and then he went to Nishapur and visited uh, uh, the tomb of the great Wali Bayezad al Bustami at Qums, and then he went by way of Demran to Saman, uh, Semnan, excuse me, where he met Ustaz Ali Nisai, who was a pupil of Ibn Sina and a lecture on arithmetic, geometry, and medicine, which he was very keen on. And he went onwards then through Kazween, and then he finally reached Tabriz on Safar 20th of 438. And there he made the acquaintance of the poet Katran, who explained passages and poems of Dakiki and uh, Maujik. And then he went to Van, Akiat, Betis, Arzan, uh, Mefarakin, Amid, excuse me if I pronounce anything wrong, Aleppo, and Ma'aratun, and Numan, where he met the great Arabic philosophical poet Abu Alaf Ma'ari, and whose character and entertainment he speaks about in the warmest of terms. Then he went to Hama, he was now in Shem. He went to Hama, Tripoli, Beirut, Sidon, Tyre, Accra, and Haifa. And he spent some time in Asham, visited the tombs of all of the prophets there and other holy places. He visited Al Quds, which at that point was part of Asham. And he arrived there at the beginning of Ramadan, and he stayed for three months in uh, Asham, in, in Quds, in Jerusalem. And then during that time, he visited Beit Lehem, or Bethlehem, and El Khalil, where is buried uh, the Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam and uh, his family and then he made his uh, first pilgrimage to Mecca in 1047 and he only stayed there and this is you have to understand that he go all this way and he stayed there for only four days after the Hajj after the Jabal al-Rahma after the days of Arafat he stayed for the days of Tashrik for the cutting of the meat he stayed for four days and he left immediately and then he didn't stay, he didn't stay and he had stayed three months in uh, Al Quds. He left immediately, and he went uh, by way of Damascus back to Al Quds, and he spent another month in Al Quds, and then he went by land to Mus or Egypt, and he finally arrived in Cairo on the seventh of Safar in the year 439 or 1047, and that was the end of his beginnings. Before going on from that I, to that most important meeting which took place when he reached to Cairo, I would say that when you read his Safar Nama, one of the things that strikes, struck me anyway, are his very detailed observations of civil, architectural, military, waterworks, all of these things. He was a mystic, but he was very interested in all of these things. And yet he was, he was intensely imbued with the gift of observation of his actual physical surroundings to which he moved. And he writes upon them, and as he's writing years later from notes, and he, he's writing about, uh, for instance, like a spring, which he notes only flows three days a year. And he continues on, and he and his brother and servant, one day they're pulled up short, and they stand amazed by a field that is completely covered with narcissi in bloom. So that the entire place looked, that it, the fields, everything looked that they were white because of the flowers. 
And as Alice uh, C. Hunsberger writes in her very informative book on Nasser Kusro, the Ruby of Badakhshan, here is a bureaucrat, quote, here is our bureaucrat, engineer, philosopher, poet, exile of later times, steeped in wonder by a thousand tiny flowers. Or when he reached the outskirts of Tripoli, he talks about, quote, lots of sugar cane, many groves of mangoes, oranges, bananas, lemons, and dates, end quote. Then he goes on to talk about the city itself, which he reckons, and, this, and he measured this, he used to pace it all out. It was a thousand cubits square. One cubit, by the way, equals 45.72 centimeters. In an area home to some 20,000 people, which is a lot of people in those days, and buildings, some of them were, quote, four or five stories high, with some as high as six stories, end quote, remarking that, quote, every type of food, fruit, and edible I ever saw in Persia was to be found there, but a hundred times more plentiful. This is in Palestine. In Beirut, he mentions a stone arch that is so high that a road goes right through it. He, he wrote, quite, quote, I estimate the arch to be 50 L's high. One L equals a cubit. The cubit is 45.72 centimeters. He says it's 50 L's high, and all sides are slabs of white stone, each of we, which weighed at least a thousand mons. I try to read, read this, and what is a mon? M-A-U-N-D. Well, a mond is 82.28 pounds, okay, like a bag of cement about. This edifice was made of bricks up to a height of 20 L's, and on top of them were set up marble cylinders, each which was 8 L's higher, and so thick that two men, I guess it was him and his brother, could scarcely reach around it. And all of this is from a man who wrote that very often, quote, very often I have to spend my nights sleeping on hard stones with no roof or cover above my head except clouds. And I carry all my belongings on my back as a beast of burden by hills, by sandy deserts, across streams, precipices, wandering from town to town. I inquire everywhere I go, wandering in search of truths. I ask the Persians, I ask the Arabs, I ask Hindus, I ask Turks. I ask Jews, I ask the people from Sin, I ask the Romans, I ask everybody I met, the philosopher, the Manishi, the Sabian, the atheist, I asked, I questioned, I pestered them, unquote, until as we say, as I said, he arrived at the end of his beginnings. He writes about that in a poem. This is when he reaches to al Qahira, Cairo. He says, then one day, I reach those city gates where angels are servants, where planets and stars are slaves, a garden of roses and pines girded about with walls of emerald and jasper trees, set in the desert of gold embroidered silk, its springs sweet as honey, the river of paradise, a city which only virtue can aspire to reach, a city whose cypresses are like the blades of intellect, a city whose sages wear brocaded robes woven of silk. And here, before these gates, my reason spoke. Here, before these walls, find what you seek and do not leave without it with these walls. So I approached the guardian of the gate and I told him of my search. Rejoice, he said. Your mind has produced a jewel. For beneath this land of truth there flows a crystal river of precious pearls and clear, pure water. This is the lofty sphere of exalted stars. I, for sure, it is paradise itself. A contemporary Afghan writer describes what happened. His stay in Cairo marks an epoch in his life. For here he became acquainted with the splendor the justice and the wide administration of the eighth Fatimid Khalifa and the Imam Abu Tamim Ma'ad al Mustansa Billah, who was born in Al Qahira on the 16th of Jumada in 420, and eight months afterwards was declared to succeed his father, who had died. His name was Ma'ad Abu Tamim, and he was called Mustansa Billah, or the seeker of victory from Allah. He ascended to the Khilafah at the age of six. And after his death, the succession was heavily disputed. 
and this dispute resulted in a split into two branches to this day called the Nizaris and the Musta'ali. Nasir al Kusro, Kadassallahu Sirif, in his Safar Nama, has described the city of Al Qahira, the excellent administration of the Fatimid Imam, the Khulafa, the wealth, the contentment, the security of their subjects, his description of Al Qahira, its masajid, its gardens, its buildings, and suburbs is admirable. And I'm reminded in this that people that I knew when I lived in Egypt and worked and studied in Egypt were. They told me these were older men, and they told me that in the, they remembered that that in the morning the watering trucks used to come around and spray the streets with rose water, and this was in the 1940s, 1950s. Sprayed the streets with rose water. Cairo was a fantastic and is to today. They call it Umadunya. The mother of Dunya. It's a fantastic city in which you can find so many things. And he describes all of this. And he describes the details of the administration. And he's impressed with the discipline and the maintenance of law and peace and order in the country. Describing the administration in beautiful words, he says, it seems that the Fatimids are the only lawful authorities and the protectors of the Garden of Allah. But most importantly, it was that in Al Qahira, the Nasser Ikusro Kedesalau Sirhu was initiated into the esoteric doctrine of the Fatimiyun and received the commission in time to carry on their call. During this period, Muslims were ruled by pre Alamut Ismaili Imams, who were also the Khalifs of the Islamic world, and this was the period in which Al-Azhar, the world's oldest university, was founded. And according to the Encyclopedia of Islam, Nasser Khusra left Persia at a difficult period when the country was being laid waste by continuous wars between various small princes. And he found the same wretched picture in all of the Muslim countries which he traveled on his journey. Only in Mus in Egypt, which he provided a pleasing exception where he saw prosperity, rich bazaars, harmony, and tranquility. As the Ismaili dynasty of the Fatimids were ruling in Masr at that time, Nasser concluded that Islam had diverged from the true path and that only the Fatimiyun could save the true believers and Mu'minun from the inevitable ruin. And I think to myself, you know, you think of the Muslim world today. People killing people, raping people, shooting people, you know, kidnapping people, all of these things. This is what was going on. Same thing. And this was the only place he found within that realm that was different from that. When Nasir Kusru Kadasalao Sirhu visited Cairo in 439, he went to visit the Imam, Al Musansir Billah, where he met for his first time his teacher, al Muayyad Fideen, Qadassallahu Asir, who was, who was then one of the twelve hujat, or the proofs of the Imam. In other words, you may bear the title of the Imam, but unless you produce somebody who knows what you know, who's the proof of your knowledge, you have not really succeeded. Hmm? That's the hujat. The proof. You can say, man says, well, yeah, I have a thousand students, so what? Who of them know what you know? That's why I say I was trying to grow a student. <laughs> grow a student. Who knows this? Who can organize? Who can take care of? Who can make sure the doors stay open? Who will do this? Who will do that? Who can make sure that there's a school for the teaching of the Quran? Who will do all of these things? who knows these things, who knows how to deal with these things, who can deal with this and that and the other thing. That is your hujah. That's your proof. If you don't grow one of these, your line dies with you. No matter you, you say so-and-so is my successor or this doesn't make any difference. Your line dies with you. 
when he met the Kwajamwayan Kadesalaru Siruhu, he says, he writes, quote, I began to ask him, this is when he just met him, he says, I began to ask him of the things that were first and the things that will be last, of the cause of the order of the world. What is the basis of things as they are? What is the genus and the way in which species are formed? I asked him about the all-powerful. I asked him about predestination and faith, both of which are never inseparable from each other. But how should one be given precedence over the others? I asked him about the mechanism of the palpitation of day and night. What a beautiful expression, the palpitation of day and night. How from these the beggar becomes rich, the darkness becomes lit, I asked him about the prophets and their contradictory messages of the reason for the prohibition of drinking blood or intoxicating wine. I asked him about the foundations of the Sharia. Why were there five prayers? I asked him about the fast that the prophet ordered to be observed during the ninth month of every year. I asked him why should zakat be different for silver coins and gold coins? Why a fifth on booty? Why a tithe on irrigated land? Why should this be one-fifth and that one-tenth? Why a brother takes one share and a sister a half? I asked about the cause of the uneven distribution of happiness. Why does it happen that a worshiper is aggrieved when the oppressor is happy? Why one pious man is unhappy and another is happy? Why one believer, unbeliever enjoys his life while a believer is dissatisfied? Why one is born of, with solid health and good looking and the other one is born blind? or weak health, and yet Allah always acts in perfect justice. Then reason cannot be satisfied by what in its imperfection it sees. I say to him, it is day, but you say it is night. I ask him, prove your contentions, and he draws out a dagger. You say that a certain place there is a sacred stone, and all who perform a pilgrimage to that become free from sin. And I say to you that Azar, the father of the prophet Ibrahim, preached the religion of idolatry. You preach the worship of a stone. In my eyes, you're the same to me as Azar. Then he changed my night, quote, he changed my night into a shiny day by his arguments, which were like the sun. He showed me both the worlds of my person and made me behold them openly as well as secretly within myself. And then he put his hand upon his heart. A hundred blessings be upon that hand and heart. And said, this is what Sayyid read at the beginning. And he said, I offer you the remedy of proof and demonstration. But if you accept, I am going to place a seal upon your lips which must never be broken. I gave him my consent, and he put the seal. And drop by drop, and day by day, he fed me the healing potion until my sickness disappeared. My tongue became imbued with eloquent speech. My face, which had been pale as saffron, grew rosy with joy. I, who had been a stone, was now a ruby. I, who had been dust, now... I was ambergris. That is a beautiful itter. If that was the end of his beginning, what followed was the beginning of his end. Nasr Kusro, Kedesullah Usiru, spent three or five years in the service of the Imam. He was appointed to the propagation of the Dawa in Khorasan. He was given the title of Hujat in Khorasan. He became one of the twelve Hujat of the office of the Imam. And during the same time, he made Hajj three more times, each time returning to study with Mu'ayyad, Qadassalahu Sirhu, with whom he undertook vast studies into the levels of hikmah, or wisdom. And as it is classically taught, hikmah is of two types, that which is related to knowledge and that which is related to action. So that which is related to knowledge is to realize the essence of things, to understand the connection between cause and effect, in regards to the creation, in the occurrence of events, of faith and legislation, as for the action-backed hikmah, or action-based hikmah, he put it simply, put things in their proper places. Action-based hikmah 
that is putting things in their proper places, operates on three levels. One, give everything its right. Do not exceed the limits in this. Do not rush it before. Do not delay it. Put it in its proper time. Two, realize the intention of Allah and His promise. Realize His justice in His decision, as well as His grace in preventing you from something. And from that which defines this level is that which has been said by the people of firmness in the Sunnah. Hikmah consists of the lofty and praiseworthy goals which are necessitated by His creating and commanding, for which He commanded and for which He predestined. Three, reach the highest levels of knowledge when making your deductions and coming to conclusions. And it is the insight, the knowledge of which is to the heart, like something which is looked at as to the eyes that are looking at it, that is, in confirming that the organ is functioning properly. And this is the exclusive and highest level that scholars can reach. This is a view, as it were, from the outside. It can actually describe both Sunni and Shi'i, general means of the transmission of wisdom te teachings. But the Fatimiyun methodology was very different in many ways and was basically organized around the ideas of the various levels of the da'i, or the caller. The organization and the function of the Fatimiyun Dawa as a secret is closely guarded, it's hard to find. There are only limited resources available on this subject, and information is very sparse regarding the Dawa activities of the Dawla in Iraq, in Persia, in Central Asia, in India, where the dua or the callers, fearful of persecution, and you'll see why, were continually obliged to observe taqiyya and secrecy in their work. All of this explains why the Fatimiyun literature is generally so poor in historiographical details on the activities of these dua, of these callers. Information that in Fatima times was only available maybe in central headquarters, that is, in the person of the Imam himself. Contemporary scholarship and post Alamut Ismaili studies, which draw on a variety of sources, including histories of Egypt, has somewhat ex succeeded in putting together a relatively reliable sketch of this Fatima Dawah. And it has much of its basis in the figure of the Da'i and the various levels and strictly defined degrees. The Da'i which is the basis of everything, literally means a caller or a summoner, which we have mentioned in, in, in Sunni Islam, we call it a, a missionary. We have these people who go around to master, to master, to master, and they're calling people to Islam, so that this is a dai. But in the Fatimi thinking, a dai was not a missionary, as he's generally is considered in the Sunni sense. A dai is a person who's responsible for the conversion of his student, as, as he himself had been converted, as well as the mental and spiritual well-being of the student, and more than that, the da'i was a guide and a pointer to the light of the imam. The teacher-student relationship of the da'i and the student Murshid was very much like what would develop in Sufism. The student wanted Allah. The da'i could bring him or her to Allah, but it was through a multi-layered process in which he or she was led to recognize step by step the true nature and light of the Imam, then the Prophet, and finally Allah. The Da'i was the path to the face of Allah, the goal of which is the truth. When I write or say the true stature and light, I do so mindful of Ibn Arabi's observation that you see a long line of people all standing in communal prayer all of whom are addressing supposedly Allah. But in reality, if you talk to them, the Allah that they're addressing may be as different as the number of people standing in the line. The question is, who is the real Allah? And given that question, who is it who can teach you, or more importantly, show you the real Allah? This is the basis of the whole journey of Nasir Kusra. And what led him to question Al-Mu'ayyid Fideen, 
who was a die of the highest level in the following manner. And I began to ask him, quote, I began to ask him the things that were first, the things that were last, the basis of the cause of the order of the world, what is, how are things the way they are, and so on and so forth, which indicates the urgency behind the statement, who does not know the imam of his time dies in jahli. If you don't know, you don't know. Life is short. It takes place in time. And the time, the Prophet said, is the time it takes to sit underneath a tree Rest your back for a few minutes and get up and move on. That's the length of a life. That's exactly when you die, you realize that's how long your life lasted. It seems like things go on and on and you do this and you pick up the kids and you go here and you go there. Just all of this is if I sit underneath a tree like this, rest myself for a few minutes like that. <sighs> And then I get up and I go on. That period of rest like this, that was my whole life. That's how much time you got. So before we look at the levels and the degrees of the dua from the top to the bottom, let's look at how they work from the bottom up. At the first place, the dua, the plural of the da'i, was mainly unknown, purposefully so, given the violence and abuse to which they are often subject. He's called the breaker, the mukassa. Accordingly, they observe the well-known ba basis, those who know, don't show. Those who know, those who show, don't know. Those who know, don't show. Those who show, don't know. This is how they work in shorthand. Let's start at a normal, everyday neighborhood masjid. After a while, in attending such a masjid, bismillah, one gets to know the regulars. And from among the regulars, one sees that there's this one or that one. They seem to want to know something more. Of course, the Wahhabi, Salafi, Takfiris, they're also on the job. Mind you, by the way, a footnote. Saudi Arabia has spent over $70 billion since 1979 on overseas work. More than two-thirds of that is in a campaign to spread Wahhabism across the world. This program, including thousands of masjids and madrasas, as well as Islamic centers that have served as support networks for Wahhabi ideology, jihadi movements, and takfiri movements, funding for the Afghan jihad was part of this wider campaign, and Saudi charities and rich people have funded radical groups and movements, as well as educational and social welfare activities across Africa, the Middle East, South and Southeast Asia, Soviet Union, the West, including the United States. So when I say that, you know, these guys are on the job, they're on the job, believe me. They make similar assessments. They come in and say, oh, you got a fan broken, let me fix your fan for you. And, oh, you're this and that and the other thing. And pretty soon they're saying, you know, your clothes, you know, they, they, you know let me get you some sooner clothes, you know, so you can get sooner down, brother. You know, and, and they bring you that, or they, they bring hijab for the ladies, or maybe it's a complimentary ticket to uh, Mecca to make Umrah, or even Hajj, uh, maybe even a year at a university in the kingdom, etc. This is brainwashing. And such blandishments, they work. Because after expending more than $70 billion, they better work. And they've been quite successful in many dimensions, but alhamdulillah, there's still some who see through this or else have tasted the fruit and found it bitter and continue to seek to find the truth among other paths. So the Dai is somebody who's trained to observe this. And at some point, he makes contact with this oddball seeker with whom he begins to enter into a dialogue. And in this process of this dialogue, he manages to slip in a few ideas that most likely would be seen somewhat strange, but are thought-provoking. And this may take place a number of times, to the point where the seeker, he wants to know more. And so you introduce him to the next level of the Dai, who is more knowledgeable, and he has a group, and he's been working in the field for a longer time, and this brother is not only able to answer questions more thoroughly, but he begins to pose a deeper level of questioning understanding and insight. This is how it works. This is how it worked then. This is how it works now. Same thing. I don't have 
time to go more deeply into this, but to say a few things that might shed some light. For instance, what really is the difference between a Deobandi and a Burelwi Muslim? Why can you pray behind some but not others? How come you can marry some but not others? Why are the rules of divorce in Hanafi Islam different than that of Shafi Islam? Why are rulings regarding riba or interest so different in different schools of Islam when the law is so explicit in the Quran about the question of riba? Saying things like, uh, Allah will deprive usury of all blessings, uh, or you who believe, fear Allah and give up the remains of your demand for usury. Or if you do not take notice of this usury, you will be uh, uh, at war with Allah and, his, and Allah and His Messenger will be at war with you. Or you who believe, do not devour, isra, uh, devour usury doubled and multiplied, and so on and so forth. There's so many things about it, but if you go to the regulars in the masjid, you're going to find that most of them don't even own their own cars. They don't own their own cars. The bank owns their cars. Whether they're company cars or personal cars, they don't own them. The bank owns them. And they pay riba on it. They don't even own their own houses. The bank owns their houses. Sometimes they don't even own their own clothes. And often they have five or six credit cards. And many of them are maxed out. They're regular in the masjid. I said, in spite of everything Allah said, it doesn't matter. And then you see how they come to the masjid. Now, they're very big on women wearing hijab. Men don't wear hijab. They're supposed to. They're supposed to cover their aura. The, the, the thing about covering their aura is just as much as a woman covering her aura. A man who has not covered his aura in prayer, or even outside of prayer, he's like a woman who's walking around without any hijab on. You see these men with these tight pants and these belts drawn here, the big crotch is sitting here like this. If they bend over, you see the bottom of their butt, and the crack in the whole thing, see all of that, and they pray like that in the masjid. But they insist, sisters, put your, put your hijab on, you know. But they don't wear hijab. Couldn't be bothered wearing hijab. That's only for women, not for men. But this is what you come across. And so some people, they start to talk to them, they start talking about these things. Now these are outer examples that I've been trying to give you. But then there's a more botany outlook to it. Then. You're familiar, everybody Muslim is familiar with the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path. This is a very simple matter. Adina Sirat al-Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. And you ask, well, brother, what is the straight path? Well, they say it's a bridge. It's stretched over the fire. That fire is thinner than the hair. That bridge is thinner than the hair. It's sharper than the sword. All the people who live will have to cross over that bridge. And the fortunate ones know it, and they cross over it and reach the garden, but the unfortunate fall off into the fire. There is a path that the people walk upon the surface of the earth. And another is a path which people follow with their souls. And there is another, had there only been the straight path, why would you have had to say, guide me to the straight path? Allah would have commanded, guide us to the straight path? I mean, that's another path that is not straight. Another path crooked, another path evil. That's an established a path. is not a path for the body, but a path for the soul. And the straightest path is the way of those to whom Allah has extended his favor, the prophets, the Nabiin, the Siddiqeen, the truthful, the Shuhada, the witnesses, the Salihin, the righteous. As Allah says, all those who obey Allah and his messenger are in the company of those upon whom Allah has bestowed his favors. And the messenger are those who convey the news to the people of the world. And the truthful means those who expound the inner meaning of the Sharia. And the witnesses are the Imams who are the witnesses of Allah to the people and the righteous are the proofs among the people because the betterment of people's souls is due to them. But you thought, oh, I know what they are. I know who the Nabiin are. They're prophets. I know who the Siddiqeen are. They're the truthful. I know who the Shuhada are. But you don't really know. You only know the names of what this word is about. And then he begins to speak about people, this Da'i, about people who claim for themselves more than what is theirs as well as those who claim a lower place for themselves. Well, I don't know anything really. 
One falls off the left-hand side of the path, the other falls off the right-hand side of the path. One says he does not need to learn, and secretly he really thinks he knows more than anybody else. And whosoever claims that he knows more, but knows less, both have fallen. So these people put these ideas into your mind, these breakers, mukasas, the lowest of the dais. They're on the lookout, the mustards all across looking out for these people who are asking. It looked like they want to know a little bit more. They're tired of potlucks and things like that. They want a little bit more than that. Got to be something more in this than that, you know. So they start asking questions. But the questions have hard answers, not easy answers. Because what you thought was true is not necessarily true. There are people who think, well, I'm a Sunni, and he's a she. I'm good, he's bad. I'm a Shadali, he's a Nakshabandi. I'm a Deobandi, he's a Barela. I'm a this, I'm a that, he's a that, he's a this. All of these things, they have all these ideas. All are Shaitan. It's all Shaitan. Shaitan's sin is what? I'm better than he is. Whatever it is, I'm better than you are. I'm black, you're white. I speak Urdu, you speak Arabic, or vice versa, I speak Arabic, you speak Urdu. Whatever it is, I'm better than you are. That's their sin. And that's what has to be combated. That's what has to come to an end. That's what has to be washed out and washed up, finished, if you're going to get anywhere. If you think that you're something and you have a, a criteria, what's the criteria? Do you know the imam of the time? That's the criteria. If you don't, you're nothing, buddy. No matter how many degrees, no matter how cars, no many houses, no many wives, no matter whatever it is that you have, you got nothing, nothing. In truth, nothing. And as long as you have those things, well, I got a house. That guy lives in a shack. I'm better than he is, obviously. You know, like the Christians who think, well, if God loves me, I got money. Proof of God's love of me is money. If I got money, God loves me. If I don't have money, and I use the word God advisedly. I mean, obviously, he doesn't have money. That's why the poor people, they give him such a lousy rap, especially in this country, because God doesn't love them. Because if God loved them, he'd give them money. Because the people who God loves, he gives them money, right? See how it works? That's how the Republican Party and the Tea Party work, just on that basis. And it's all shaitan. So that is the lowest level that it works at. This is the mukassar, the breaker. His job is to change the way you think. His job is to insert into your mind little niggling things that cause you, like, for instance, why is it that, you know, it says, Ati Allah wa ati Rasulu wa ulul amavan minkum. Obey Allah, obey his Rasul, and those in power among you, those in authority among you. And so on Eid Day, like 10 years back, and now it'll be two years forward, you know, you watch Egyptian TV, and there's Husni Mubarak. And sitting on his right is the Sheikh of Azhar. Sitting on, sitting on his left is the Mufti of Egypt. They know he's a thief! They know he's a robber. They know he's corrupt. They know all of that about him, but they don't say anything. It's Eid. He's the president. He's Ulu Lamar. He's the one who's in authority. And next it'll be Assisi, the new one. And it'll be the same thing. The Sheikh of Azar will be here, and the Mufti will be there. And he may start off clean, but he ain't going to last clean. That's the way it is. But these people put this in your mind, and they say, well, how come is that? How come a man who is regarded as the highest authority in Sunni Islam, the Sheikh of Azhar, how can he sit with a murderer, with a corrupter, with a liar, with a thief, how can people go and do business in the capitals of the world with these killers? 
Who is Hillary Clinton? That she stands up in front of the people and tells them that the leader of some country of, uh, of Syria, for instance, has blood on his hands when she's up to her waist in blood. It's like Putin said. They think they can say whatever they want to say and because they say it, that's the way it's going to be. That's the way it is. These are the things. This is the hypocrisy of life. And you've got to see this. And if, you, if it's just business as usual, and they said you want to do business with the devil, you want to eat with the devil, you better have a very long spoon. Shakespeare said that. And this is what it is. People are eating with the devil every day. People are doing business with Yazid every day. Filth and filth. This is the story. On the other hand, if you start at the highest levels of the Dawa or the organization of the Da'is, you have the absolute or unrestricted caller who is a person who is in touch with the Imam and is at work directly under his leadership. And these are also called Da'i Adu'a or caller of the callers. They are ones who are in touch with the Imam. And they have huja, which I've talked about before. Sometimes they're called bab, because as he said, ana Medina al ali babuha. So you talk about the huja. The huja is the bab. Who is the bab? The bab is the proof of you, because if you know something, if you're a sheikh who knows something, you ought to be able to get this person to know what you know, because you're going to die. You're going to die. Sooner or later, you're going to die. And if you haven't transferred that, your knowledge, here and there, to somebody else, who's going to continue? Or will it be like the places in India where it's father and son and grandson and so on and so forth like that, and they don't know nothing about nothing? Except they keep the place going, that's so you can say something for them. So you have to have this man, who's, or a group of them who are that, and then after them you have the Da'i al-Madud or the one who is the assistant to this person like that, again the Hujjah. And for the purposes of all of this, because there's somebody who has the whole thing in understanding, the world was divided into 12 parts. They called these parts the Jazeera. Most people ignorantly thought it meant islands. So they spoke about the islands of the earth, of Jazeera min al-Ard. But Ivanov says, no, no, Jazeera means, does not mean island, it means, and he takes the basic sense of the root, Jezara, to cut something off or slice it or cut it or part it or section it. He means the 12 islands are the 12 sections of the world population, which at that time were Arabs, Turks, Berbers, Negroes, Abyssinians, Khazar, China, Dailam, Rum, and Sakaliba, whatever they are, each of those is a separate thing because the psychology of each one of those people is different. You have to have a mukasa, you have to have a breaker in that place who understands, like when we used to teach, we used to have a school for teaching in the summer, and a lot of Sister Clara Muhammad people used to come, and we would teach, but they say, no, no, you, you don't understand, we have a different reality, we're black people in America, we have a different thing going. What you're teaching, you're white people in America. Right? Well, white people in America have a different reality than black people in America. It doesn't mean white people or black people are better than each other or anything else like that. It just means that they look at the world differently. So the person who's going to insert this knowledge into their mind has to be somebody who understands their mentality. So these were called the islands. And each island was under the charge of a high-ranking dua, a high-ranking da'i, rather. Uh, and each of them has their huja, or as it's called in early Fatima times, the yad, their hand. So they called the man the yad. Later time they call him the breaker, the breaker of patterns and habits and so forth like that. In the beginning they call him the yad, the hand. Huh? So there's a whole 
thing about that, and this was really like as I say that the, the, this man, the Mukasa, the breaker, was responsible for attracting prospective converts, and I'm going to call them converts, not reverts, converts, and breaking their attachment to other religions, to other sects, to other schools, to other things, so that the ordinary Fatimid initiates, the ones who understood this, they call them the friends of Allah, the awliya of Allah. And they're not, they don't belong to the organization because they're not doing anything really in the organization. They're just simply people who finally understood the truth of the matter. Hmm. So this whole thing was a very, very, very highly organized uh, situation, well uh, thought out. And the way it started was very simple. We don't care what you are. We don't care what you are. We don't even care if you're a Muslim. Because you'll wind up being one if you listen to us. We don't care what you are. And we don't think that what you are, we don't care if you're rich or poor or black or white or red or yellow or from the north or the south or the east or the west or whatever. We don't care anything. Our function is to guide you home is to bring you back home. If I can't bring you back home, I know my friend here who's been at this longer than I have who can help you more, and he knows somebody who can help you even more, and so forth and so on like that. And we want to return you to your original self, to the being that Allah created in the beginning. And so, for instance, how does our Juma go? Our Imam is still alive. A mom sends us a message, say, okay, this week talk about brotherhood. Okay, good. Talk about brotherhood. Well, the khutbah lasts about 20 minutes or 30 minutes because everybody's got to go back to work. So you can't say very much about anything in 30 minutes, as this is proof. So, okay. So then the people who are happy with 20 minutes or 30 minutes, they leave. But their people want more than 20 minutes. In those days, there was no QTV or anything like that, no internet or something like that. There was just that person, that caller. So we have a period after Salat al Juma that's called Ta'alim, teaching, education. And he spends the time between then and Asr explaining what he said in that 20 minutes or 25 minutes, giving you the depth of the teaching, giving you the depth of the understanding of, for instance, the subject of brotherhood or the subject of usury or the subject, whatever the subject happens to be, good or bad, until you reach Asr. Then you pray Asr, and those people who want to leave, leave, but there's some people still want more. So you take them to this place that's called Dar al-Hikmah, the house of wisdom, not in the mosque, Dar al Hikmah. And who speaks in Dar al Hikmah? The Imam. And he tells you the deep of the deep of the deep of the deep of what it was about, why he gave this original idea for this khutbah in the first place. This is how this is how the teaching worked for the generality of the Muslim community. You take what you want. You want 20 minutes? Fine. We'll give you 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Is that's enough for you? Kifayat. You want more? Hang around. We'll give you more. You want still more? Hang around a little bit longer. Because in those days, that was a day off, by and large, right? Hang around a little bit longer, and you'll work from, from, from Asr to Maghrib, and we'll give you a still deeper teaching. This is how it worked. Then you have all week to try and put it together to work on it. So this is who these people were. Now, who were they concerned with? They were concerned with what I say, everybody. After you're born, things happen, as uh, Rumsfeld used to say. But in the beginning, everybody is perfect. 
And if in the beginning everybody is perfect, then surely there must be a way to return people to perfection. And this is the true and the deep reason behind all the teachings of the Fatimids under their Imams, who through Nas, or the explicit designation, which is a prerogative bestowed by Allah upon a chosen person who before his death, with the guidance of Allah, transfers this Imamate to another person who ensures the continuity of the Wilayat in another body. And that's what happened to Ali when the Prophet said, Alayhi whose Mawla I am, Ali is his Mawla. Ana Madinat al Ilm wa Ali Babuha. For men arad al Ilm, filiati al Bab. I am the city of knowledge. Ali is its gate. Whoever desires knowledge, let him go in by the gate. In other words, these people knew what they were talking about, they knew what they were doing, they knew how to go about doing it which was nothing less than the attempt by spiritual means to return people to their original perfection of Asani Taqweem. And the whole elaborate system that I've described of these layers of up and down and breakers and these and the people under the Imams and everything, all is for that purpose, is just simply to return people, all and any people, whoever they are may be. Because he doesn't say, he doesn't say that he made the, the only Muslims to be in the Asani Taqweem. Allah al insan, insan, al mana al insan. What does it mean? Everybody, everybody, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, whatever, Kafirs, whatever you are, you were born perfect. Everybody was born perfect, and we know how to return you to your perfection. This is what the school was. This is what the school is, then and now. What are the reasons for this behavior, which is so obviously, when we look at things, for instance, what we see in the world, not Muslim, in contrary to everything that Allah and His Prophet have made known to us, hatred of other human beings, killing of other people, raping of people, throwing acid at people, all of these things, you know that this has nothing to do. Can you imagine the Prophet throwing acid in the face of a girl who wants to go to school? No. Allah says, hold fast, people, to the rope of Allah all together. Do not be disunited. Remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies and he united your hearts and he made you brothers. The believers are brothers, so make peace between your brothers. Do not find fault with your people. Do not call each other by bad names. Help one another to good and righteous works. This is all from Quran. Do not help one another in sin and aggression. Do not hate one another. Do not be jealous of one another. Do not boycott one another. Be servants of Allah as brothers. Tell that to the to the to the Sunnis and the and the, and the Shi who are fighting in the streets of Syria. Do not hate one another. Be as brothers. It's not lawful for a Muslim to sever his relationships with his brother for more than three days. You will see the believers in their having mercy for one another, love for one another, kindness for one another. It's like the human body. When one limb is sick, the whole body feels it. If your tooth hurts, your whole body hurts. One part calls out to the other. None of you will be a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself, said the Prophet, according to Al-Bukhari. These are the suggested models of relations which are not being followed by Muslims. And instead we find that it is a good deal of our behavior as Muslims to other Muslims, not to mention to Christians, not to mention to Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, whatever, all derived from that prime sin of shaitan, which is his belief that he is better than Adam. Kala men manaka ala tasjud ila am artuka. Kala ana khairun minhu khalakatani min narin wa halakatu min teen. He said, what prevented you, Iblis, from prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? And he said, I am better than he is. 
you made me from fire and you made him from clay. All of these wars in Syria, in Egypt, in Libya, in Mali, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Bahrain, and on and on and on to your local mustard, even into the Zawiyas, are based upon the shaitanic belief that I'm better than you are. We are better than you are. We are Sunnis, you are Shia. We are Hanafi, you are Maliki. We are Deobandi, you are Burelwi. We are Naqshbandi, you are Qadri. We are Chisti, you are Shadli. We are Salafi, you are Sufis. We fix the beginning of Ramadan by calculations, but you insist on visually sighting the moon, and so on and so on and so on. And as Bob Marley said, and everywhere is war. Everywhere is war. And all because one person or one group think they are better than the other and they know and the others don't and it's our way or the highway. But during this Fatimi rule, it didn't matter who you were or what you were. What mattered then and now was how close your belief, your iman was to your amal, to your behavior. Ya yuhaladina aminu wa amilu salahati, which was matched to your original nature of your fitra at the time of your birth. And Allah has promised to those who appoint those who believe and perform good deeds as his representative on the earth. If you look up Fatimid dynasty, you look up Fatimid empire, you look up Fatimid caliphate, you look up Fatimid beliefs, you'll find hundreds of views. And with most of them, what they say, these people were gulat, these people were kafirs, these people were extremists, these people were exaggerators, these people are dogs, and so forth. According to many of the early scholarly interviews that have been made, either taking into account biased sectarian perspectives or considering it as a minor chapter in the history of Islam, have given the difficulties faced by scholars wishing to obtain manuscripts in Sunni countries. Thus, the picture of Shiism and this specifically this, this Fatimid Shiism has emerged as one a political and economic based movement which has degenerated into a religious millennium an Arian heresy. And in the Middle Ages, there was hardly anything you could find about this. We would have to look to the Crusader writers, people like William of Tyre and Jacques de Vitry, and all of these who were marred by, 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 by prejudice and distortion for the most part. More even-handed and deeper studies began finally to emerge in the early 20th century from the Russian scholar uh, Ivano, who beginning from the 3rd century of the 20th century, of the 20th century devoted his endeavors to the study of these phenomena and he, he wrote, wrote a great book from his studies early Persian Islamism in 1948 and there was a pupil of Etienne Gilson, Henri Corbin who was put in touch with Iranian Shiism by Massignon was head of the French the Islamic study department at the, the Corbin at the, at the uh, Sorbonne you know who contributed to the development of this study by outlining the important aspects of the mystically oriented ethos of Shiism at the Sorbonne. Corbin eventually wound up after World War II in Tehran as the director of the French Institute of Iranian Studies and founder of the series Bibliotheque Iranian. Never abandoned his spiritual and scholarly attachment to Iran and Shiism, devotedly collected, edited, translated some of these works of Shia Theon. Otherwise, we won't know anything of their philosophy and their Gnosis and the Irfan. And roughly around the same time he trained a generation, a whole generation of scholars that would eventually vivify international debate on this subject both in Iran and in Western academia through his many contributions. His intellectual circle was in turn linked to the broader and prestigious milieu of European scholars meeting on regular basis at the Irano sessions in Ascona in Switzerland. Among that group were Garcia Elilade, Gustav Jung, Carl Jung, and, and Gershon Scholem, and the, and the famed Iranian intellectual Sayyid Hussein Nasser, who a prolific traditionalist scholar, still alive and presently based in North America, besides writing a number of popular and best selling books on Sufism and Shiism and so forth, founded the Imperial Academy of Philosophy in Iran, which after the revolution was renamed the Institute for the Study of Hikmat and Philosophy. Still going. 
and that eventually became beside the French Institute of Israeli Studies under Corbin, the second research of attraction for these academics, Iranian and foreigners alike, interested in the study of this subject. Outside of, of Iran, two major centers were involved in Corbin's effort to do this. The Ecole Pratique de Etude of the Sorbonne, where Corbin used to teach very dense courses. You can see this very dense material related to the pioneering research in Iran. In the second place was McGill's University in Canada of Islamic Shiism, the Institute of Islamic Shiism, who was founded by Dr. Wilfred Canwell Smith. From 1964, Corbin's close associate, Herman Landolt, professor of Islamic thought at the Institute, he continued these more important public intellectuals and researchers shared a common path with these pupils and they played a pivotal role in Iranian internal debate even till today and their names are well known in Iran. More than tangential to the main characters of this environment were the contributions of the revered Imam Ulama, most notably the late Alama Tebetabai, most well known for his Tafsir al Mizan, 28 volumes, only 14 of which are translated. You can find it in the library here in Charlottesville. Why were the others not translated? Because the authorities of the imperial or the what do you call it the Islamic Republic they do not interested in letting these these ideas be known They're not interested in it. in later years this man would often hold the Tabatabai would hold study sessions with Henri Corbin, Sayyid Nasser and others in which not only the classical texts of divine wisdom and gnosis were discussed but also a whole cycle of what Nasser himself called comparative gnosis, in which each session the sacred texts of one of the major religions containing mystical and Gnostical teachings such as Tao Te Ching and the Upanishads and the Gospels of John were discussed and compared with Sufism and Islamic Gnostic doctrines in general. Where is this today? We don't have 92 billion dollars to spend. <laughs> we don't have it. We don't have it. The situation, alhamdulillah, changed somewhat for the better at the end of the 1960s when a major event occurred in marking the passage of the study of this from a small circle to a broader audience of specialists and readers. In the 1968, the Colloque de Strasbourg, a round table about it, attended by then leading specialists of Imamism were present, the old generation of the Islamists who had done research on it, people like Henri Corbin, Vajda, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, Francesco Gabrielli, Wilfred Medelung, and the leading Lebanese Alam Musa Sadr, whose paper unfortunately never reached the editors and is missed from the proceedings. But all of these things became, for people like me, innocent, naive, whatever you want to call me, you know, people who came across these things. Allah bless these people. I trust, as I said earlier, that the listener will don't find what I'm talking about a digression, but understand that if you want to find out about who this Ismail, who this Nasir Kusra was, that you have to have to understand this. Alhamdulillah that there are places that you can understand. It. There's a well-known cliché which is attributed to Winston Churchill that says history is written by the victors. And this being the case, since the time of Salah Adin Ayyubi, better known to the Western world as Salah Adin, the first Sultan of Egypt, Sultan of Egypt and Syria, founder of the Ayyubid dynasty, who put an end to the Fatimid rule, put an end to this. It's been it's very difficult to know the reality of this Fatimid thought the true mission of the Dawah, to convert total darkness at every level into light. In every cycle, a portion of darkness is reconverted into light. And these cycles will continue until all is converted into light. And all matter that exists will be transformed back into the original form and its light that will ultimately prevail. And it is this reason why the custodians 
of the literal legal ex post facto prophecy. The legatees of socio-political Islam have done everything that they could do to obscure the name of the Fatimids and reduce them to utter obscurity and cast doubt upon the sincerity and truth of Islam because they knew and know that it doesn't matter in the end who you are but what you are. And among these related it is interesting why Ali and Hussein and so many more who took their path were murdered and martyred. Why? Because of this understanding. In Al-Qahira, the Ayyubids under Salah ad had all the treasures of the Fatimids. This is just like Halugu did in, in, in Baghdad, including all the books burned, thrown into the Nile, onto a great heap, the ones that were left and covered with sand. So there was a regular quote, it was called the Hill of Books was formed. And it was said that the Mamluk soldiers used to sole their shoes with the bindings of these books. And the number of the books alone said to have been disposed of varied between 120,000 to 2 million. This is what happened. We've never recovered from it. Never recovered from it. That's why Syria exists. That's why Egypt exists. That's why Mali, that all of this exists because we live in stupidity. We've been reduced to stupidity. This bright thing of Islam has been covered with muck through the stupidity of these worldly people. The Fatimid. Khalifa, the Khilafa founded in the Maghreb in 297, over its lifetime embodied one of the greatest successes of Islam in terms of its actual and real adherence to the true teachings of the Prophet as mercy to all creation, as mercy to all beings, and its dedication to the restoration of humanity to the best of form, to the fitra. It came to an end functionally after 262 years and the teachings for all intents and purposes have been lost from then until now with, except for rare pockets here and there, except that remains as distortions. People don't even understand what it is. Half-truths, lies, where, a point where there was in this very room a bright young lady came who was studying Islamic history at this major uni U.S. University of, of University of Virginia had no little or no idea of who or what the Fatimids were, when in actuality or what their teachers uh, teachings consisted of. And here's the United States, founded in 1786. It's now 2014, 228 years of existence. Do you think? that little or nothing will be known of the United States in a thousand years? Maybe, maybe not, but most likely not. Yet this is what's happened to the memories of the Fatimid Khalifa in the eyes and the minds and the hearts of most Muslim people. If you talk to them, they think that these people, all the things that I've said about them, from dogs to, uh, well, uh, to extremists to this to that, they are not really there except for the most part as distortions and half-truths, and you have to dig and dig and dig and dig to find some truth about them. You know? Oh yes, you can say, I've lived in Cairo, I know, there are ruins in Al Cairo, there are, as our university, there's the Master al Hussein, salam, but there's just old buildings and assorted historical rubbish, that's what the people think, with the exception of a few scholars and people, culture mavens and people like that who are interested in these things. But most of the people, nothing. They don't know what, how did these, it's like people in the street, they don't know where those buildings came from. They don't know what they represent. They don't know anything about them. They don't know what, oh, that's Azhar. Or oh, that's Al Hussein. Or oh, that's Sayyid Zayna. Or oh, that's Fatima Nebuya. Or this, they don't know what it is. No idea what's behind it. Only the, the outer manifestation of what's left of it. Too spiritual by far. That's the truth of it. And that is not only in the Sunni world. And I wish that 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 that, that say Dusty was still here because it's also the world of modern day Iranian Shia. Devoid. They, they don't have the figure of a legitimate Imam. He's lost. He's in seclusion. So what you have in reality is the same political, legal setup that the Sunnis have, which 
becomes the justification for the institution of the rationalist imitation, the taklidiyani of the most learned and the management of political power by its ultimate theorization, the marge taklid, the source of the imitation, who function under the supreme leader, the Vali Faki, who in the absence again of an imam, who of course is in occlusion or seclusion for a thousand years or more, at least according to some, and if the truth were to be known, those people want to keep him in seclusion because they don't want to lose their jobs. And there's another view, of course, of the hidden imam is still on earth among the body of the Shia, among some of the groups, but he's incognito. So what can you do? They have the same problem. They're no different than the, the, than the Sunnis in that sense. What I say, all of the above is held without any relevance when in truth the teachings, these teachings, if you can understand these teachings, are of the highest relevance, not just in the political legal realm of modern Islam. I want you to understand why I'm writing this about Nasser Khusro. Look up about him. you find all these things. He was this, he was that. Poet, philosopher, traveler, blah, blah, blah. All of these things. Red, blah, this, that. All of these things. Made Hajj and so on and so forth like that. But you won't find in all that stuff on the net, and believe me, I've looked at all that, they'll never talk to you about what he was thinking. Never. Hardly ever. Yeah, I talked to him, he was a great philosopher, he was a poet, he was a mathematician, he was a this, he was that, but they won't talk about this. And according to Dr. Irono, who is, 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 cares about this, for him, Nasser Khusro was the truth, this is a quote, was his, his truth was only Islam. And it may be easily realized that the truth, and that this philosophy, this stuff and all that stuff, was nothing to him. The thing that was to him was Islam. And it is quite possible that he might have been a Shia because of the changes of things and everything, the upset in his career, the frustration of his youthful ambitions, his probable contacts with Islam. But that's what he wound up being. And after completing his higher studies under the Da'iya Mutlaq al Muayyad Fidina Shirazi and the Imam, he returned to his native land after seven years and served as a, as a Da'i of the highest rank, a huja, because he had become the huja of his teacher, the proof of it, the proof by the nature of his being, not by his books, not by his philosophy, not by his studies, not by his theoretical knowledge, but by his being. How one might ask, can one in this time hope to realize this degree of knowledge and understanding? And on a general level, you can read all these books and so on and so forth and talk about all of these things, and he did this and he did that. But the reality is and how he paid attention to this and he knew about that. But that's all beside the point. Really, it's beside the point. The Ismailis or the Fatimas, like all of the Shia, believe in the hidden meaning of the Quran. Now we come to the nexus, the real thing of it. They believe that the Qur'an has a hidden meaning, which they refer to as ta'wil. In the tafsir, the literature of Sunni Islam, the word tafsir and ta'wil are used almost synonymously. But in Shi'i Islam, both have distinct meaning. Tafsir in Shi'i Islam refers to the vahri meaning of the Qur'an. Hmm? What does it mean? Bismillah awal akhir. The ta'wil refers to the hidden meaning. The Sunnis and the Shi differ on the meaning of the sixth verse of chapter 3, the chapter of Al Imran. According to the Sunni commentaries, this verse means no one knows its inter interpretation, the Quran, except Allah. And then it stops. And then it says, and, and meaning in English, because most people here are not speaking Arabic, that these people who are firmly rooted in knowledge say, we believe in it. That over there, we believe in it. It's all from Allah. It's all from our Lord. This, according to Sunni commentaries on the Quran, Allah alone, thus, according to the Sunni commentaries, Allah alone has the knowledge of ta'wil. And the Rasikhuna fi ilmi, or the great ulama and Arafin, they don't possess that knowledge. And they believe that it's known only to Allah. But the Shi, these, especially the Fatimis, believe that this knowledge of ta'wil 
is possessed by the Rasakun of Ilm, and they don't stop there. In the, the, the ones who believe in this that only Allah knows us, they believe more, that they believe that the Rasakuni fi ilm, these people of knowledge, know it. And these are the teachers, these are the Imams, these are the people who come from Fatima and Ali. These are not only Allah that knows, but the Prophet and his inheritor, alayhi salatu salam, and his inheritor, and the Imams, and the progeny, they possess the knowledge of ta'wil. And that takes us, what is this? It takes us, it's called ilm and laduni, which you find in the Quran, knowledge which passes orally from the Prophet to his wasi, and then from the wasi to the imam, and then from one imam to the other, and to the students who are gathered. But if we go historically, then one finds the exposition of ta'wil literature later and this and that, it all gets changed again. But the hidden meaning or the botany meaning of these verses is attempted by the imams and the, and the callers after the spread of knowledge in the world and the Isla Greek knowledge in the world. And they were written about the, in, in the, the Rasayil of Iqwan Safa, the brother of purity, are great importance. These epistles do not attempt exposition of Tahwil systematically, but contain elements of it and could be taken as the exposition of the dis discipline of Tahwil. And these Ismaili Da'is, Yaqub al-Sijistani, Jafar Mansur al-Yemen, Qadiya Numan, Hamidun al-Kirmani, Muayda Shirazi, and several others played a great role in making this clear. And we're thankful to them. It's no exaggeration to say that this Ilm al-Ta'wil is really unique to, the, to them. It was a major attempt that was made to synthesize all the knowledge of the time. Because the knowledge belongs to everybody. They, the, some people, the Orientalists say that this is Greek knowledge came into it and that's where it all comes from. But the, the, these, the, the, the people of the Fatimi say, no, this was Ilm and Nubuwa. This was the knowledge, prophetic knowledge of the Prophet that he transferred to Ali and it's been passed on from Imam to Imam. It's an oral knowledge. And we do not find its record, they say, before the epistles of the Ikhwan of Safa. But one say, that's because the knowledge wasn't written. Because they didn't believe in writing it. They only believed in speaking it. And this is what it's based upon. It's based upon this, this spoken knowledge, based upon reason. And it means, in Arabic, ta'wil means to go to the first, the primary, the basic meaning of the word and go from there. It's like jazir. Like this, everybody think, oh, it's talking about islands. No, it's talking about we've divided it up into different sections because jazara means to cut something up. That's ta'wil. One who recites the kalima, one who performs the outer rituals, the dhahri rituals, prays, fast, pays the kaat, makes hajj, everything, is a Muslim, no doubt. But there's a difference between a Muslim and a mu'min, which is love, first of all. And this is one who not only performs those prescriptions, the mu'min prays, the mu'min fasts, the mu'min makes zakat, the mu'min makes hajj, he does all of those things, but he also believes in the real, original, intended meaning of why he's doing these actions, and he's not praying for Allah, because Allah doesn't need any prayers, he's praying for himself, because he's imperfect, and he needs to be perfected. And the Ismailis, they say to the, the dwellers of the desert, say, Amana, we believe. Say to them, Ya Muhammad, you don't believe. You submit, Aslama, but Iman hasn't entered your hearts. This verse makes the distinction between Islam and Iman, between those who submit, Muslims, and those who believe, Mu'mins. According to them, it's not acceptance of what is manifest, Zahir, but it is only, but it is sincere belief in the hidden and the original. And before we go any further, it's necessary to shed some light on what is botan and what is the way it is done. And it is important to note that ordinary people are not supposed to know about this. Ordinary Muslims aren't supposed to know about this. You go talk about this in the masjid, you talk about the botan, they say, oh, blah, blah, blah. We get, come on, brother, you know, let's forget about that. 
It's only the chosen few or the initiated. That's why we talk about 85%, 10%, and 5%, or 2% of the 5%, and all of that. How many people know? It's only the chosen few, and yes, you say that's elitism and everything. Yes, it is elitism. It was a strictly guided secret, even kept from ordinary believers, and the reason was obvious. These people were looked upon as heretics by Orthodox Muslims. Ghazali wrote a whole book on them, and he accused them of believing in hulul and tanasuk, that is, incarnationism and transmigration of souls. That is not true. Even Kamal Hussein, who was chairman of the Department of Islam, Ismaili Studies at Azhar, refuted those allegations. They believe, as we've sought to make clear, were misunderstood about what they believe. And they fear, they have fear of this, and so they hid from the generality of Muslims their beliefs. And they hid all of this away and revealed it only to the chosen or the initiated few through the process that we have described, step by step, spoonful by spoonful. You put it into the person until they understand, and they ask a question. It's just like you look at that building, the Pentagon, and you see that there's a hole in the wall there, and they tell you an airplane flew through it. And you know, and I know, no airplane ever flew through it because an airplane has wings and an airplane has a tail and the hole is like this and it has nothing like that and has nothing like this and they lied. They lied. They lied. And once you know they lied, nothing is ever the same. You're like Alice in Wonderland. You've gone down the rabbit hole, and things are not what they seem to be, not at all. That's the world. So what you've been told is like this young woman who comes to me, who are these people? How, I ask you, how can a young, intelligent woman who's studying Islamic studies at a major university in America not know about who these people are? How can it be? Or what they know, or what she knows is only bad things about them. For the most part. How is that? Because there is a conspiracy, if you want to know the word, to hide that, just as there's a conspiracy to hide the fact that no plane ever flew into the into the into the Pentagon and that the towers didn't fall down because of a fire, because jet fuel burns at a certain temperature and that temperature doesn't melt steel and the steel inside of the building of the World Trade Centers was never men melted by jet fuel because it doesn't burn hot enough to melt steel and so that's another lie or two more lies, that's three lies and it's all a pack of lies. That's what it comes down to. According to the Fatimis, there's a whole ideal system. When you look deep and you dig far enough, there's called methal, which is a resemblance, means methal is a resemblance to something else. There's something exactly like it, but it's not necessarily the same. Here on earth, there's a corresponding system. It's called memthul, which is representative of the ideal or what is symbolized. To understand that it is necessary, you have to know. And this is what they get down to. This is the part that freaks people out. Allah, Allah is a totally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, is a totally transcendent being who cannot be comprehended by any human mind at all. Nobody knows who Allah is. Nobody. Nobody. He's beyond knowing. The closest Sunnis come to say, or as Allah says, rather to say, who mithli who shayun. He's not like anything. Not like anything. You don't know who Allah is. Those all of those guys standing in a row praying, they're all praying to a different Allah because they don't know who is Allah. Nobody knows. This is first thing you the last and first thing you have to understand. He cannot be comprehended by any human mind at all. Allah transcends every conceivable thing and is just incomprehensible. He has no attributes. He is not actively involved in creation of the universe. He only created the ukul, that is the intellects that are made of pure light. And these intellects are fine beings made of light. 
and the matter as opposed to light is kathif, heavy and dark, and Allah, the ultimate being, has no role in the creation of matter. He is referred to by Sijistani as Mubdi al Mubaid, the Mubdi al Mubdiat, the creator of the creators. His role ceased with creation of the Ukul. Allah moves, creates only light, and another dimension of darkness which moves faster than light, which is called the black light, and which physicists talk about as the black hole. Matter was created by the intellect. The intellect was also called, which is called Asher al mudabi the tenth intellect. It manages the universe. And since the Asher al mudabi Mudabir is responsible for the creation of matter. This universe is responsible to convert darkness into light. The corresponding being on earth to this tenth intellect is the Prophet. The Prophet is the Mamthul of Ashr and Mudabir on earth. He assists that tenth intellect in transforming. He's a, he is a pure being of light. That's why he says, I was before Adam was. He is transforms transforms that thickness, that heaviness, that darkness into into nur. Allah, the Prophet shows us this right path, and this has been described by Allah. He is called Allah calls the Prophet Sirajan Munira, the lighted lamp. For this reason, he transforms human beings into light. The Prophet is the Imam who performs this function, and he cannot be, and it is not any Prophet after Muhammad. Finished. He is succeeded in the Walayat, or the explanation by the Imams of the progeny of Fatima and his daughter, and Ali, her husband, peace be upon them. But according to their beliefs, the earth can never remain without an Imam alive upon this earth a spiritual guide, an active agent who is upon this earth. And the Imam on the earth is the representative of this intellect and commands the highest respect of the believers. He has all the attributes of that. And since Allah has no attributes, Allah has no attributes. He transcends all attributes. He's beyond all attributes. Huh? When Allah says, he's not like anything else. Therefore, the Imam, who is the Mamsul, of the tenth intellect on the earth has these attributes here. It is this theory of attributes which was misunderstood by the opponents of the Fatimid, even this person, good person here, as the belief in hulul or the descent of Allah that that person that they bow down to that person is Allah. They didn't. He didn't. Allah didn't tell Shaitan to bow down to Adam because he was Adam made of clay. He told him bow down to Adam because Adam had blown into had 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 been blown into him by the spirit of Allah, and he told Shaitan bow down to that spirit of Allah. And Shaitan was so stupid that he didn't realize, even though he was a very bright being, he didn't realize that Allah was not telling him to bow down to a piece of clay. He was telling him to bow down to that spirit that was inside that clay. That's what he was told. This is what we say about this thing. This is the theory of attributes which is misunderstood by all the opponents of these Fatimid Imams as the belief in Hulul, or the descent of Allah, or the transmigration of souls into the person of the Imam. As I said, this Dr. Kamil Hussein described this in his Muqaddaba to the Diwan of Sayyidina al muayyad al-Shirazi, the teacher of, of, uh, 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 of Sayyidina Nasir al-Kusro, that the person of the Imam does not in any way correspond to Allah, but rather to this tenth intellect, the highest form of intellect. The Ismailis understand in the cyclical history, theory of history, since the duty of this tenth intellect is to convert darkness and thickness into the universe, into light, in every cycle of history, a portion of darkness is reconverted into light, and these cycles will continue until the entire matter is reconverted into nur, and there is no more thickness in this universe. In every cycle there is an Adam, an Adam who is created, Adam, 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 and the chain of prophethood ends with the last prophet, Muhammad who in turn is succeeded by the Imams, and by every cycle there appears to the Qayyam al 
the man of the day of resurrection, the Kiyama, the cycle ends with the Kayim al Kiyama, and another portion of dark matter is converted into light in that cycle, and these cycles will continue until there's no more matter in this universe and everything is light. That's what they believe, in essence. And all of this is not enough that there is another major problem in getting to know the real thought of Nasser Kusra, and that is in the problem of finding a living, realized teacher of the order of Muayyad and Shirazi who can explain this to you, not to mention the very great difficulty in finding the Imam of this time and the dire consequences of not finding him. He said, there are no more, so I was told. The tree, the hand, all are gone. The assembly dispersed, the hand concealed and veiled in secrecy. And I stood before you pale and skeletal, clad in a woolen cloak, and I kissed your hand as if it were the grave of the prophet or the black stone of the Kaaba, and he put his hand upon his heart, a hundred blessings be upon that hand and that heart, and said, I offer you the remedy of proof and demonstration, but if you accept, I shall place a seal upon your lips, which must never be broken, and I give my consent and he affixed that seal. And so drop by drop and by day by day, he fed me the healing potion until my sickness disappeared. And again, we must remember that painted cakes, my brothers and sisters, do not satisfy hunger. Forever and ever, there is no choice but to pack up your bag and take to the road, inwardly or outwardly, if you want to know the truth. I have reached the end of this bayan. As a gift to the reader, I have included this with this book, but alas, not for the listener, and I have appended this for you. I am now myself 75 years old. It was only four years ago that I went, or five years ago, that I came across this ode and registered at least some of the profound depths of its many meanings, and I am very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he granted me these years that I never thought I would live beyond so that I was able to live long enough to read it, for it changed my life and marked a very real turning point in my path, which is the search for the Imam of this time, and I hope it will be for you, dear reader. I apologize, or listener, I apologize if this way and this talk has been far too long, but there are no, so many things to say, and there's so little knowledge on this subject. Perhaps not on this subject, but how one gets to it. A lot of ups and a lot of downs, a lot of ins, a lot of outs, digging here, digging there. As the poet said, Nasar Kusu, Kadesalao Sirhu, many a night I made a stone my pillow. The clouds were my tent. I sank as low as fish. I descended as high as the stars above the hills. Now in land where water was frozen as marble. Now in a land where the dust was hot as a spark. I roamed now on the sea, now on the plateaus, trackless waste, mountains, sand, streams, up and down, precipices, a coil of rope around my shoulder like a camel driver, a pack on my back like a mule. I went my way searching from city to city, from shore to shore. Wallahu alam. And I must mention in the completion, in case you thought everything that I said is in the past, Consider this. In 1998, the Taliban ransacked, burned, and destroyed the Nasser e Kusro Foundation Library in Kabul, Afghanistan, which consisted of 55,000 books, which included an unparalleled collection of Sunni and Fatimi works, including a magnificently bound thousand year old Quran. Well, maybe the Taliban used that as a binding as a sole for their shoes. I remind you that not all that is known is to be said, and the right time has not come for all that is to be said, and it is not all appropriate sayings that should be said to those who are not capable of understanding. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for listening.